right, take your Bibles tonight. Turn with me, please, over to the book of Acts, chapter number 13. Appreciate that good choir music, good choir singing. Amen. Honoring and glorifying the Lord. Every time the choir sings that, I want to run laps. The problem is, I didn't got so old and fat, I'd be jiggling for 15 minutes after I got done. Amen. If I made a lap, I might run out of gas about halfway around. I have to finish the rest of the service out in the sound booth or something. Boy, I love to hear that choir sing that song right there. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Acts chapter 13, when you find your place, stand with me, please. The Bible says in Acts 13, verse number one, now there were in the church that was at Antioch, Certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews and they had also John to their minister. I want to preach tonight on these verses using a phrase out of verse number three as my title. They sent them away. So we're going to preach on tonight. They sent them away. Lord, help us tonight. As we turn our hearts and minds now to the Word of God, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you'd be glorified and magnified in the service. Lord, tonight as we attempt to do the best we can to fulfill the Great Commission in a very personal way, I pray, God, that you would just breathe on this service and touch us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for standing. You can be seated. Tonight, with God's help, and here over the next couple of days, Calvary Baptist Church in Dundalk, Maryland will be doing exactly what the church at Antioch did in Acts chapter 13. When the very first missionary team was sent out, of a New Testament local church. After a year and a half almost of deputation, Brother Nathan and Sister Marissa and Baby Landon will be heading out on the 13th to go to the mission field. After years of preparation, years of prayer, years of planning, years of dreaming, years of seeking God's will, Brother Nathan, in just a few days, the will of God for your life will become a reality in a very new way. And uh, I can tell you from personal experience that the mission field from that side is different than it is from this side. There's something about buying a one-way ticket halfway around the world and landing in that country, reality starts to set in. But I know that God's got his hand on both of y'all. Otherwise, our church would not be doing what we've done and what we're doing tonight. But what we're doing tonight, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the highlights of any local church's existence. And that is the privilege to send a missionary out of their church to serve uh, on the mission field. Uh, down through the years, I've collected quotes from missionaries and missions quotes, and I use them from time to time. But one of my favorite quotes is this, a church should not be concerned so much with their seating capacity as their sending capacity. And uh, here at Calvary Baptist Church, we have been blessed uh, to have uh, not one, but four missionaries now out of this church, starting, I suppose, nearly 40 years ago, 30-something years ago, with Brother Wes Lane and his wife going to Haiti and if I'm right, correct me if I'm wrong, graduated from this Christian school here and went to church here and then went to Haiti and now in the Dominican Republic, that uh, one big island. 
Hispanola, I think is the name of it. If I'm, am I right? Did I get that right? Wow. Okay. Half of it's Haiti and the other half's the Dominican. They served all these years there. They were sent out of this church, in the very real sense of the word. And uh, we're still their home church, and we're blessed from time to time when they come through and be able to hear from them and be able to uh, give them money and do things. And we've had the privilege to go visit and, and, and be in the ministry, be in the churches, visit the churches. I've got to preach in them. I've got to go down there and see firsthand. We've gone up and down the streets and passed out tracts and literature and um, hung on for dear life as Brother Lane drove the roads of the Dominican like a bat out of the bottomless pit. But that's our missionary there in the, in, in the, in the, in the Dominican. And then Brother um, Sasser and his family serving in Israel and working with the Jewish people. By the way, we're going to be getting Brother Sasser up here in a few services to give us an update. They're going over there and going to Turkey and doing some stuff. That wasn't a secret, was it? Should I say that on the internet? And going over there and do some amazing things. You were telling me about this morning. Be able to have them out of our church going and serving and laboring and working and then Brother Estep and his family down in Leon, Mexico of 15 years serving the Lord, sent out of this church, their sending church. What an honor to be able to hold the ropes in more than one way for these missionaries. And now tonight having this commissioning service where in just a few moments we will as a church lay hands on them and send them away as the text says. But Tonight, I want to just really, if I can, just bring out three basic points that I see in these verses that I believe would help us and believe set the tone for the service tonight. The first thing that I notice about this first missionary team in our text was the experience in the church that stirred them. Here's what I like about these verses in Acts 13. The Bible says in verse number two, as... They ministered to the Lord. Make no mistake, God opens doors for people that are already serving. God opens doors and he leads people into ministry that is already engaged, already has a burden and a heart that has been moved and stirred for ministry and for service and God calls people to work that are already working. Can I get a witness? God opens doors for people that are serving. God opens doors of ministry for people that have proven to have a heart of ministry. There's a, a lot of misconceptions about missions and mission fields and the Lord opening doors. And I'll never forget one time years ago in another church, a man stood up in the service without ever talking to me, without ever bringing me off to the side and say, I believe God's doing some things in my heart and give me an opportunity to be a sounding board or give me the opportunity to give him some feedback. He just stood up in the service, cold turkey, said, I want you to pray for like God's opening the door and we'll go out west and help so-and-so, help them build a church, help them start a church. And the first thing that came to my mind was, well, you ain't doing that here. Why would God send you out west to do something you ain't doing here? No reason why I didn't speak out and embarrass him because he was only to be my daddy. So I just bit my tongue and let it go. And it ended up fizzling into nothing. He never went. I didn't expect him to. Why would you go to Colorado or Wyoming or California and help a man go soul winning when you won't go soul winning in your own church? Come on now. Don't die on me. We just had leadership orientation yesterday. Y'all ought to be hollering amen. Y'all ought to be foaming at the mouth right now. Why would God send you? He's not going to send you halfway around the world to do something for the first time that you've never done before. God came to them and God called them to the mission field, but they were already laboring and ministering and serving in their local church. That's a very important part of the story. In fact, if you'll back up to chapter number 11, you can get a pretty good idea of what they were doing. The Bible is just pretty vague in chapter 13, verse number two, and says, as they ministered to the Lord, it calls them prophets and teachers in verse number one. You get to verse number two, it just says, as they ministered to the Lord. But when you back up to chapter number 11, you get a pretty good idea of what they were doing. The Bible tells us in uh, verses number uh, 19, 
Now they which had scattered abroad upon the persecution that rose about Stephen traveled as far as Phineas and Cyprus and Antioch preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene which when they were come to Antioch spake unto the Grecians preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. What about that? A bunch of people just accidentally got saved. I'm saying that tongue in cheek. They were preaching to the Jews only in verse number 19, but then a bunch of people from Cyprus and Cyrene and the Grecians heard the preaching and got saved in verse number 21. The hand of the Lord is with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was at Jerusalem and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch who when he came and had seen the grace of God. What a blessing. Seen the grace of God. I don't want to get distracted here because this is a good text for another message. But the grace of God that had worked in their life brought about some visible results. <laughs> Come on now. Is everybody okay? When he saw the grace of God, he saw these people, he saw the change and the transformation that the grace of God that bringeth salvation had appeared to all men, teaching them that denying and godliness and word of lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus chapter number two. The grace of God will bring about visible change. And the Bible says they sent Barnabas down there to Antioch, scope it out. And when he got there, he saw the grace of God. I'm thankful for a grace that you can see. I'm not talking about the one I'm married to. I'm talking about one better than that. If you can believe it, amen. Let's keep reading. The Bible says, and uh, he, 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 uh, when he came in verse number 23, and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and the faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. Make no mistake, Paul and Barnabas were serving God, laboring together in their local church long time before Acts chapter number 13. Right, right, right. Amen. They was tag teaming on these new converts at Antioch. And the Bible says in verse Numbers 26, when he found him, he brought him into Antioch and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And uh, so we see in verse uh, chapter number 13, verse number two, that the exper their experience, their, their, their ministry experience in the church had stirred their heart and they were already busy seeing people get saved. They were already busy seeing the new converts disciple. They were already busy, can I say it, making Christians out of believers. They were already doing that. They were already encouraging them. They were exhorting them. They were already, the Bible says, teaching them and trying to persuade them and encourage them that with purpose of heart, they should cleave unto the Lord. That's what they were already doing in their local church before they ever got their prayer cards printed. The experience in the church that stirred them. i tell you what else I noticed as I was just reading these verses in chapter number 11. Verse number 24, Bible says he was a good man. Talking about Barnabas was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen. We're going to see the Holy Ghost mentioned here in just a minute in chapter 13. We're going to get to that in just a second. But can I tell you something? They didn't wait till they was commissioned to go to the mission field before they learned how to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. They already were. They were already laboring. They were already serving. They were seeing people get saved. They were discipling people. They were teaching people. They were busy. They were, they were doing everything within their power to expand the kingdom of God in their local church before they ever got called to the mission field. One of the things that I dealt with a week or so ago, I preached down for Brother Sykes at the B. Salt Church Planners Conference. And he had me doing sessions on mentoring missionaries. And I told him, I said, here's the problem. I said, we're not discipling new converts to get a pool of men ready for God to call to the mission field. God's not going to call a new convert to the mission field. 
He's going to call somebody that's established, that's been grounded, somebody that's disciple, somebody that's already uh, uh, earned, some, earned some stripes. I mean, the Bible's clear, lay hands suddenly on no man. That don't mean talking about the person in front of you at the checkout counter at Walmart that's getting on your nerves. That's not talking about that. Lay hands suddenly on no man. It's not talking about not punching somebody's lights out. It's talking about putting your hands and putting them into the ministry before they're ready. One of the qualifications of a bishop is not a novice. Amen. So I believe I'm biblical tonight when I say God's not going to call a brand new convert to go halfway around the world and start a church. And the problem that we're seeing in our churches is we're not doing our due diligence to train and disciple men that get saved so that at the time that God wants to, he can come by and tap them on the shoulder and call them to preach and call them into the mission field. We need men in the church that are doing in their local church what we are sending money to missionaries to do. You've heard me say it a hundred times. We're not, we're not, we're not uh, subbing out the great commission to all these missionaries. We're sending money to them. We're sending them $100 a month at the least. More fire missionaries. But that doesn't alleviate this church of its responsibility to do in this church what we're supposed to be doing. No matter how much money we send to China or the Philippines or Japan or, or Nicaragua or, or Argentina, that's not going to do a thing in Dundalk, Maryland. That's our job. That's our responsibility. And God was able to reach out and put his hands on Paul and, and Barnabas and call them to the ministry because they were already serving and ministering and working in their local church. One of the side effects, negative side effects of a church that has staff like ours, and not all churches have staff. Some have more staff, some have less, some have none. One of the negative side effects of a church like ours that has paid staff is that some people get the idea, well, I'm just, we're paying them to do that. That's the wrong answer. Everybody in here needs to say amen on that right there. There's nobody up here on this platform that can do what God called you to do in this church. Everybody's got a place. Everybody's got a responsibility. Everybody's got a job. And imagine, imagine if Calvary Baptist Church could be a place that sends missionaries around the world, but God's not going to come by our church and call men and call couples and call families to the mission field if they're not already filled with the Holy Ghost and serving and seeing souls saved and helping disciple new converts and, and helping make Christians out of believers. He's not going to call you to the field. I remember when I was on deputation, I, 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 I think God used me to help a lot of people breathe a deep sigh of relief. Our family was going to Africa, and at that time, there wasn't seemingly, I don't guess there was a whole lot of people. We didn't bump into very, very many when we were on deputation going to Africa. Big as that place is, you'd think there'd be more people going. But there wasn't when we were on deputation. I'm not saying there wasn't more going. I just didn't run into very many. So it was almost a novelty that our family was going to Africa. And I'd go into churches, and people, you could just see them tighten up and wad up. And I'd be preaching. I'd say, hey, if you're not tithing, if you're not faithful to church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, if you're not knocking doors and inviting people to church, church, if you're not pouring water on the hands of the man of God, if you're not praying, if you're not reading your Bible, you can relax. God is not going to call you to Africa. And you can almost see the relief. Wow, okay, so I'm good. Totally missed the point. Totally missed the point. God don't call people to the mission field that are not already working, already serving. Amen. Now that was not preached as a deterrent. I wasn't preaching that so you could go, oh, okay, so if I just don't tithe and go to church faithful and see people get saved, God, I don't have to worry about God calling me to the mission field. You're missing the point if that's what you took out of that preaching right there. The point I want to make is they were already doing what should be done. I would have a hard time sending Brother Nathan and Sister Marissa to the Philippines if they weren't already doing what God had called them to do. Amen. They've been going soul winning since they was tall enough to reach a doorbell. For Nathan, that's when he was two years old. 
They've been involved in church. They've been involved in, in bus ministry. They've been involved in junior church. They've been involved in, 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 the, in, the, in the outreach. They've been involved. They've been given to faith promise ever since they started making money. They've been tithing ever since they started making money. They've been cultivating a relationship with God from the time they were children and teenagers. And tonight we're going to send them to the Philippines to just keep doing over there what they've been doing over here for years. Their experience in the church that stirred them is a very important part of this story. Notice what it says. It says, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. You know what that tells me? It tells me that they were relying on God to help them do the work of God. I get real uncomfortable around these 20-year-olds, still wet behind the ears, that's got it all figured out. Pray, do tell. I will pay for the coffee and we'll go out and you tell me all the stuff that I don't know. I want to hear it. We got some 20 year olds coming out of Bible college that's got all the answers. And they've sat back and they've analyzed. I preached about this a little bit yesterday in the leadership Leviticus, Nadab, and Abihu, second generation priests. Offered strange fire unto the Lord. What Moses was doing and what Daddy Aaron, the high priest, was doing wasn't good enough. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna reinvent the church. We're gonna reinvent the wheel. And they offered strange fire. Verse 2, we find out real quick what God thought about that. He burned them up. He cooked them. Oh yeah. Absolutely. You know what they found out too late? All fire is not the same. And I told our church yesterday during leadership orientation, it's not the lost people. It's not the unsaved. It's not the drunks and the prostitutes and the dope pushers that are coming in and changing the churches. Most of the time it's the second generation crowd. That sat back and they watched it and they think to themselves, if I could just bump daddy out of the way and I could get in there, I believe I could show him how it's done. You know what this tells me about them ministering to the Lord and fasting? It tells me they were relying on God. Amen. See, fasting is what you do when you're dealing with a problem bigger than you. <laughs> Those disciples had that man come up to him, that little boy, and they couldn't help him. Jesus and Peter, James, and John was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they came down and the man said, uh, you've uh, you got a pretty lousy staff here, Jesus. I came to them with a need and they couldn't help me. I brought to them my son and they couldn't help him. And Jesus said, well, we'll see, we'll see if we can't help your son and we're going to have to have a staff meeting later and address this problem. And he helped that little boy and he healed that little boy. And the disciples pulled him off to the side and they kind of whispered, said, why, why couldn't we help him? I love that. They didn't have the guts to ask him in front of everybody. They had no problem making a fool out of themselves in front of everybody, but they didn't want to get help in front of everybody. Come on now, that'll preach right there. They pulled him off to the side after it was over with and said, why, why couldn't we help him? Jesus said, this kind comes only by prayer and fasting. <laughs> Y'all were dealing with spiritual warfare. You were dealing with right. demons from hell that's been doing what they do for thousands of years and you come bouncing in there chewing your double bubble and thinking that you're just going to be able to take care of business. And the problem is you need God to get it done. Yeah. You need God to get it done. We see the experience in the church that stirred them. Number two, we see the expectation of the church that separated them. I love verse number two. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the, what's that next four-letter word right there? Oh, my goodness. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. 
the expectation of the church when they brought Paul and Barnabas in was summarized in one word. It's time for y'all to go to work. They'd already been working. Good, there shouldn't be any big problem then. Just keep doing what you're doing. Just do it somewhere else. Here's the problem with a lot of people today in the ministry. Here's a lot of problem today with young men going into the ministry. And I know this firsthand because I get phone calls all the time from churches looking for a preacher and they say, here's the problem. We got this 25 year old and we told him that we needed a pastor and that we had been without a pastor for a year or two. We got a group of people, we got a building and we need a shepherd. And the first thing they want to know is what their salary is. First thing they want to know is what, do you have a parsonage? Do you have a, do you have a, 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 a car allowance? Do you have a, a membership at the country club? No, I made that one up. <laughs> but they might as well. Because for them, the ministry is more about having a title and a position. Like we saw uh, in, in Matthew yesterday where they said, we want to sit in Moses' seat. They weren't worthy to wipe Moses' sandals, but they wanted to sit in his seat. Tell everybody what to do. And it was a do as I say, not as I do mentality. That's what it said. They wanted to be seen of men. Can I tell you something? Ministries work. If you do it right, it's work. And I mean hard work. I mean stressful work. I mean the kind of work that makes digging ditches look fun. Come on now. Brother Bittner, you've been down there at that Baltimore Rescue Mission how many years? 35 years. I'm going to say this with as much love and respect as I can. But when you come walking in that back door and come hobbling down that aisle, you can see the toll. You can see the effect. You can see what it's done to you down there fighting with those drug addicts every day of your life and trying to get them saved and trying to get them dried out and trying to get them back to their family. Hey, it's work. It's work. It takes a toll on you. You lay in the bed at night and wonder, why can't I go to sleep? Can't turn my mind off. Mine's just dealing with problems and thinking about conversations with people and just thinking about all the things that need to be done. And I'm telling you right now, the ministry is work. When you go to the Philippines, deputation is over. I'm telling you, I'm saying this. You know, you, you know I know what I'm talking about. The riding from church to church and sitting at the display table and standing back there with that, with that celebrity status in some places, some places they don't care if you live or die, but you know what I'm saying, where you go in and you're the missionary and you got your prayer cards and you do your presentation and then they take you out to eat to the all-you-can-eat buffet afterwards and you get in your car and you ride home and you stay in motels and prophets' chambers and missions' apartments and you get so many goodie baskets you ain't got nowhere to put your baskets. <laughs> All that's over with. When you get off the plane in the Philippines, it's going to be time to dig them work boots out and roll your sleeves up and go to work. And I mean all day, every day for the rest of your life. It's work. We call it the mission field because it's a field and that's what you do in a field is work. Jesus said in John 4, 35, Say not ye there yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Plural. They're wide already to harvest. It's called a mission field because it's work. Talk to anybody in here that's ever done any farming. My pawpaw was a farmer. I'm telling you, man, it's work. Yes, sir. And this, was this verse was before tractors. Tractors made it a whole lot easier. They, I mean, plowing a field back in the day was hard manual labor hooking up a mule and hooking up an ox and put a plow in the dirt and drag that thing and plow a field and turn over soil and turn over fallow ground and tear up rocks and throw seeds and plant fields and, and harvest crops and all the tools and all the implements. They didn't have all the John Deere's and they didn't have all the combines back then. It was work. It put blisters on your hands. You went home at night soaking wet with sweat. That's what the mission field is. It's work. Which is why we don't have too, too many people saying, here am I, Lord, send me. Hardest thing they've ever done is unplug their Xbox and plug another one back in when that one wore out. That's the hardest thing they've ever done. 
Feel how quiet it just got right there? God ain't calling gamers to the mission field. I can tell you one thing, the mission field ain't no game. Now there'll be joy if you'll stick with it. But that's the closest thing to a joystick you're going to get when you get to the mission field. Come on now. All them controllers. Y'all, I don't even know what I'm talking about because I don't have one. I don't, I, don't do, I don't know how to do it. If somebody put a gun to my head right now and said, start this game up and play it, I would just say, shoot me. I don't even know which button does what. I have no idea which button does what. I could get up a four-point alliterated outline before I could figure out which button to press. I mean, an outline on why I don't know how to do it. <laughs> God help us. Matthew 9, 38, Jesus said, pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth. Y'all didn't say that next word very loud. I don't know if it makes you nervous or if you just wasn't sure you were supposed to. Let's work on that. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work Whereunto I have called them. I love work, don't you? Good old fashioned work. Good old fashioned, nasty, dirty, greasy, grimy work. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Y'all keep on. I'm going to be here all night long. I'm thinking of stuff. It's just coming at me fast. Y'all just looking at me like, is he for real? Is he serious? Is he serious? I'm serious, sister. Work! Mission fields work. My goodness. The needs of the mission field. And, and, and I hope I didn't put him on the spot when I said, what are you going to have them do? That's going to be, that, that's going to be at the top of the list and it's just going to be pages of stuff that you're going to be doing. The, the awesome thing about the mission field is you don't know when you get up in the morning what you're going to be doing. You're going to do whatever God puts in your path. And you're going to deal with whatever problem and fight whatever battle and help whoever shows up. And it's just going to be all day, every day, just ministry and working with people. And I know they're going over there to help Brother Marco. And they've got, they've got a church, and a growing church with the hundreds of new converts. They've got the Bible Institute and they've got the Christian school and they've got the little uh, abandoned baby drop off place where people drop off babies and they got that and, and they, got, they got the call center and they got all these things. And I'm telling you, there's going to be more work to be done over there than there is people to do it. Yes, Better go with the mind to work. Mission field will chew up and spit out lazy people. Sometimes you see these missionaries get to the field and about six months later they come off the field. There's a reason for some of that. Not all of it, but some of it. It was way more work than what they thought it was going to be. Yeah. The expectation of the church that separated them was for them to go and do the work that God had called them to do. Well, I could preach for about an hour on that right there. By the way, when it comes to the work of the ministry, it's very unusual from any other kind of work that you do. Everybody in here that'll go to work, oh, well, you won't go to work tomorrow, it's a holiday, but Tuesday you'll go to work, most of you. And you've got a job. You've got something, you got whatever your job is that you're supposed to do. There's a, there's, there's a job. And, and in most of your cases, you'll work all day and then you'll go home and you will be able to say, I accomplished this, 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 and this. Brother Michael, you, you change out windshields for, what's that place? Safe light and repair, safe light and replace. <laughs> I heard the jingle in my head. When I see him, I just think jingle. <laughs> he'll go to work, he'll go to work, and there'll be windshields with cracks and holes and stuff in them. And when, and when he gets done, there's cars with new windshields. Stay with me now. I know this is deep. Stay with me. We're going to walk through this step. 
And here's the thing about, here's the, thing about the ministry. If you're results oriented, you got to be real careful that you don't get discouraged because you'll work for days and not be able to see anything accomplished. Sometimes the Lord will let you see things accomplished and sometimes he won't. And that's when you just stay faithful. And remember that verse. Let's not be weary and well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Boy, sometimes in the ministry you wish you could, it was like when you was in construction. I remember when I was in construction, we'd get out and we'd get all of our tools out, set up our saw benches and chop saws and skill saws and run cords and air compressors and nail guns and ladders and walk boards and we'd get out for about eight hours and we'd bust it and it come quit time, we'd all load up and get in the truck and as we drove out of the driveway, we could look in our rearview mirror and see what we did. And there was a feeling of accomplishment. That house didn't have any siding on it when we got here this morning. Look at that side. Look at that soffit. Look at those corner boards. Look at that deck all built. And look at those handrails all built. And boy, that's beautiful. And you could drive away with a feeling of accomplishment. But when you're in the ministry, you don't always get that. In fact, many times you go that morning and there's no siding on that wall. And when you leave in the afternoon, there ain't no wall to put siding on. You lost ground. It's worse when you get done than it was when you started. Welcome to the ministry. And that's when you just keep working. You work. Not with our service as men pleasers, but as a servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. You just stay faithful. Just stay faithful. Stay faithful. Stay faithful is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Our missionary in the Sahara that we took on just a few weeks ago and his prayer letter was in our Wednesday night prayer sheet. I can't say his name online. Been there 40 years plus probably. And people getting saved now. People getting saved. People getting saved. I remember what his prayer letters looked like when he first got there. He could have wrote a prayer letter in size 18 double space font. Pray for us that somebody would get saved. Muslims in the middle of the Sahara Desert where it's 120 degrees in the, de in the, in the shade. They didn't see nothing happen while they, first while they was there. And Brother Sasser and them working over there in Israel, people ain't chasing them down the street. Hey, give me that track. I want to read that track. There's a lot of missionaries think it's, they're going to land on the mission field and people's going to be going, come over to Macedonia and help us. That was Acts. That's not happening in the real world most places. Philippines is very receptive. But you understand what I'm saying. I'm saying the expectation is work. It's work. Brings me to my third point. We see the endorsement of the church that sent them. The endorsement of the church that sent them. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when the Holy Ghost says, do it, you just swallow real hard and say, yes, sir. You don't argue with the Holy Ghost. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. <laughs> Imagine what that church was feeling. Imagine what that church was thinking. Two of the best workers they got. <laughs> they sent them away. Sent them away. That phrase has just been wearing me out, Brother Burner, for the last several days. They sent them away. I was working on this message Friday. And I had to stop, Brother Snipes. I called my wife. I said, I'm just going to come home. I can't do this right now. And you know what I found out? <clears throat> I found out it's hard to ride a motorcycle through Dundalk when you're crying. <laughs> they sent them away. <laughs> That's what we're doing. That's what our church is doing. 
or sent them away. Why? Because the Holy Ghost said to. This is the work of God. God's the one calling the shots here. God's the one giving orders. And when you get orders from headquarters, you go. Those of you that was in the military, you know. When you got those orders, you could walk in there to your commanding officer and you could pitch a fit all you wanted to. It didn't change anything. Uncle Sam wants you over there. Pack and go. GI, government issue. You're not your own. <laughs> Property, the United States government. Guess what? We're not our own. Bought with a price. When God says go, you go. Boy, the trio this morning, wasn't that a beautiful song about being in the will of God? My goodness, we were talking about that at the lunch table. That was absolutely phenomenal. Listen, you absolutely nailed that song. Being in the will of God. There's no place like being in the will of God. They could have argued with the Holy Ghost and said, well, we're just doing just fine right here. But God had a plan. God had a plan. And we cannot underestimate the importance of the local church's sanction and commissioning of these missionaries. I saw two things in this point right here. I don't have it on the screen, but here's two sub points. There was the commendation of the church in verse number three. And then verse number four, there was a confirmation of the Holy Ghost. Now watch this. The Bible says in verse number three that the church fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them and sent them away. Is that what your Bible says? But look at verse number four. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's amazing what God will do in the church when that church will partner with the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost can walk into a church and lay his hands on some people and say, separate them. I've got to work for them. And then the church can in, put their hands on them and pray over them and send them out. The Bible says the church sent them out, but the same Bible says the Holy Ghost sent them out. Right. Well, which one sent them out? Exactly. Come on. Yes. <laughs> they both did. Because God, stay with me, God the Holy Ghost works through the local church. I got a problem with these missionaries that are parachurch. And they're quick to tell you which mission board they're with, but they want to mumble with the name of their church and their pastor. I got to put a big question mark over that joker. <sighs> Makes me mad. Makes me mad. I said it gets under my skin, it makes me mad. So many missionaries today fail to understand the biblical relationship with their sending church. They're sending church, their home church. They're going to go over there and they're going to work in that church for now anyway until God tells them not to do something else. I know the name of this church. Is, I'm drawing a blank, brother. Nathan, what's the name of that church? Faith Baptist. Faith Baptist Church in the Philippines. And they're going to be busy over there. And they're going to be working over there. And they're going to be trying to grow that church and trying to get people saved and baptized and discipled and, and mentoring preachers and training missionaries and church planners and sending them out all over the Philippines and all over the world out of that church. But their home church is us. Until you've ever been a missionary in a foreign country pouring your heart and soul into a church, but you as a member of another church, ascending church, you can't understand that whole dynamic right there. But I want to show you something. I'm trying to wind this thing down. Look at chapter 14. Look at chapter number 14 toward the end of the chapter. The Bible says in verse 26, and, and thence, this is, after their, this is after their journey, their first missionary journey, okay? They went out and did all this stuff. Look at verse 26. And thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. You see this relationship between these missionaries and their home church? This is rare right here. 
Notice this little outline right here, Brother Adriel. There was a recommendation of their local church in verse number 26. There was a return to their local church. There was a rehearsing to their local church. And I believe in the latter part of verse number 27, there was a rejoicing with their local church. And in verse 28, there was a relationship with their local church. I like it. How to preach right there. Their church recommended them. When they got finished, they came back, gathered everybody around, and they showed their slides. Can you imagine what that meeting was like? They're trying to describe all that God had done in those previous two chapters in all those cities and all those places and rehearsed. They rehearsed. I wonder if they kept a diary. I wonder if they kept a journal. I wonder how they did that. I wonder if one of them had a knack for drawing and had a little scrapbook with little sketches of people bowing in the synagogues. I don't know. I think about that kind of stuff. And they gathered them all around and they rehearsed all that God had done with them in the work. Well, it's a good thing, Brother Burner, they worked while they was gone. They wouldn't have had much to tell when they got back if they hadn't. How he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And they abode a long time with the disciples. We see the commendation of the church. Tonight our church in just a few minutes will lay hands on our missionary couple. And that is a, that is a sign, that is an outward, that was an, as an outward gesture of we put our hand, our stamp of approval on this family to go to the Philippines and do the work of God. That's what it is. We see the commendation of the church, but then lastly we see the confirmation of the Holy Ghost. Boy, I'm going to tell you, I wish I had about 45 minutes to preach this point right here. We got a lot of guys graduating from college with degrees, but they don't know a lot about the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right there. I wish there was some way, Brother O'Donnell, we could, we could screen out college graduates and say, when you get full of the Holy Ghost, you come back and we'll give you your diploma. Amen. Because that feel of the Holy Ghost is what's going to get it done. I, I noticed something about these verses I've never had seen before. And I've read this passage, I don't know how many times. The ministry of the Holy Spirit Church is essential when it comes to missions. Yes, sir. Verse number four, they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Chapter number 11, verse number 24, Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Ghost. We know Paul was full of the Holy Ghost. But when you get down to chapter 13, they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Verse number six, and when they had gone through Isle unto Pat Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. And it hit me this afternoon as I was finishing up this message that one of the great demonstrations of the essential ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in this story right here was that God had gone before them, ahead of them, and prepared the heart of the people to receive the word of God. It is no small thing that this man was calling for them to come and preach to him. I can tell you how that happened. God the Holy Ghost went ahead of them and prepared the hearts and prepared the field so that when they got there, they could do the work of God. Amen. That's important. Imagine getting to the field and they're calling you, hey, come over here. I want to hear you preach to me. I want to hear the word of God. That's exciting. That's awesome. But now let's put a little twist to it. Let's mix things up a little bit. Let's throw a, let's throw a witch in there. Let's throw a sorcerer in there. Let's throw a, de a demon possessed. Let's throw some spiritual warfare in the mix, shall we? Right, yeah. <laughs> Paul and Silas, this man's over here wanting you to come preach. Well, let's go. Well, they get over there and there's a sorcerer. I'm going to go ahead and just tell you this right up front. There ain't no one of us in here equipped to deal with that without the Holy Ghost. Right. Amen. Amen. 
You want to talk about getting in over your head, and I mean getting in over your head fast. You get on a mission field and you start dealing with spiritual warfare and you start dealing with sorcerers and witches and you start dealing with people that's up to their neck and up to their eyeballs in, in the occult. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to find out real quick whether or not you fool the Holy Ghost. We was talking about that crowd at lunch. I'm seven sons of Sceva. <laughs> what chapter was that, Brother Caleb? Acts 19. Acts 19. Yeah, we're going to go in there and we're going to cast the demons out. <laughs> yeah, the Bible says they came running out of the house naked. Right. Sons of Sceva. Yeah. They was running around in their Skevas, Skevies. <laughs> <laughs> Must be where it come from, running around in their Skevies. Sons of Sceva. Going to do the work of the, try to do the work of God in their own flesh. And they ran out of the house. The Bible says, naked and wounded. Hey, you can't do missionary work unless you've got God, the Holy Ghost, helping you. Let's keep reading. Oh, this is good stuff. Verse 9, El Elymas, the sorcerer, for so was his name by interpretation, withstood them. Let me just throw this in here. Anybody in a hurry? I feel a little preach coming on. You study that Bible right there. When people that were demon possessed, they always withstood the man of God and the word of God and the ministry. That ain't changed. A lot of these crowd that's fighting God and fighting the church and fighting the man of God and fighting what gets what God's doing, you mark it down, friend. They're demon possessed. They don't just have a burr under their saddle. It's not just a difference of opinion. They are a tool yes. and an instrument of hell. And I'm going to tell you something, but Nathan, you're not going to know when you get up in the morning that today's the day I'm going to run into somebody demon possessed. You just better have your armor on, friend. You better get up in the morning and you better get that armor on yes, sir. if you want to withstand against the fiery darts of the devil. Stand in the evil day. You don't know when, the, it's not on your calendar circled in red, today's the evil day. Okay, the 12th is going to be an evil day. No, 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 it, it could be today. Right. You better get your armor on. You better be ready. Am I still in the book? Ephesians 6. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we're dealing with in America. Yes. You think it's bad in America. You think it's bad here. You think it's bad here. You get on a plane and go halfway around the world and you're going to have a wake-up call, friend. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. The demonic spiritual warfare our missionaries deal with on a daily basis. You need God. You need the Holy Ghost. Let's keep reading. Withstood him seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, well, what do you know? Filled with the Holy Ghost. <sighs> set his eyes on him. I'd like to have been there when Paul set his eyes on him. He gave him the old stank eye. Come on now. Well, if our preacher was full of the Holy Ghost, he wouldn't look at people that way. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> And said, verse 10, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. It's amazing how a preacher would talk and act when he's full of the Holy Ghost. Pretty much goes against everything you hear lost people tell you that people do when they're full of the Holy Ghost. Don't you love it when lost people that wouldn't know the Holy Ghost if he walked up to them in the street. Don't you love it when they tell you what people would and wouldn't do when they're full of the Holy Ghost? <laughs> Child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right way of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. And the deputy... The one in verse number seven that would say, hey, y'all find Paul. Y'all go find them two missionaries from Antioch. Bring them over here. I want to talk to them. I want to hear. I want, them, I want them to preach to me for a little bit. 
And God had already been working in his heart, obviously, for him to be calling for them. Come on now. Am I reading too much into this? I don't think so. He's standing over there watching all this. <laughs> Paul ain't even preached to him yet. He's been given old Elemas the, 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 dirty, the dirty eye and telling him he was a child of the devil and making him blind. And him walking around saying, somebody please help me. I don't bump into nothing. And the deputy's over going, I really wanted to hear them while ago, but now I really want to hear what they got to say. Look at it. Look at it. And the deputy, when he saw what was done, <laughs> believed. <laughs> Being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. What am I saying tonight? I'm saying there's no substitute for the anointing and the filling of the Holy Spirit.